tester and development would drive you towards this design instead. And this is a mess. This is, you can't tell what it's doing. There's so many layers of abstraction. You've completely lost the basic meaning, which is deciding which page to display, depending on whether the save of the record was successful. He says, you're harming the clarity of the code through needless indirection and conceptual overhead. And, you know, I think he's got a point. If, if the alternative to that first piece of code is that second piece of code, I think he's got a point. Indirection is, is a funny thing. Uh, a very famous computer scientist said, like in the 60s or 70s, all problems in computer science can be solved by another level of indirection. This, this, will, uh, this will solve everything, more indirection. Until uh, some smart guy, Kevin and Henney, pointed out, <laughs> except the problem of having too many layers of indirection. This is, uh, and this, uh, this is a real problem. I don't, I don't know um, what you see when you look at the code that you're working on, but occasionally I, I look at a piece of code and I think, okay, so what does this do? Where's the thing that actually does something? I've clicked on several strings of methods now and I'm just finding interfaces. Where's the stuff that does stuff? You know, <laughs> that, that can be a problem. Um, Over-design, over-engineering. And if going back to this, uh, this code cart I talked about before, by some measure of this, we have improved the design, but we have added a layer of indirection. That's what this interface is. This sensor interface is a layer of indirection between the alarm and the tire sensor. The previous design was simpler. It had fewer elements. Actually, this new design, this could be overkill. This could be over-design for the problem. Um, and whether it is or not is a judgment call on the part of the designer. And I think the thing about TDD is it does push you towards trying to isolate bits of code so that you can test them. And it does mean that you're more likely to create abstractions. Now, going back to uh, David's example here, uh, this code that touches the database and the GUI, that he said you needed this whole horrible thing in order to test, is actually not true. Some, some smart guy on the internet wrote a blog, blog post basically explaining that Rails already has points where you can override stuff, uh, where you can get in and, and um, separate this unit for test. And he showed how to test this code without changing a single line and getting a perfectly isolated test for it. So there is already um, enough abstraction in this code, actually. The reason you might want to do it like this, with all these uh, various classes and much more levels of abstraction, the motivation for this is scalability. The guy who suggested this design for Rails uh, was talking about scalability, he was talking about when you've got a Rails application that is doing a million things and has a huge database and you need to shard the database and you need to uh, run the, the business logic on a different server because the web server can't, can't handle it, you know. So when you really have a, uh, a performance problem, that's when you would turn to a design like this. The primary motivation for this isn't, in fact, testability, although it does have as a side effect that this is testable, um, all the m more layers of abstraction do help with testability. But that's not the primary motivation for it. So actually, I think David's example falls down. I don't think he's really presented a convincing case in that example for test-driven development causing design damage. But I think he does raise an important point, though, that this thing of, that you need to be aware that if you're doing TDD, it will be pushing you in the direction of introducing abstractions and interfaces. And it will push you away from tight coupling and, and lots of collaborators towards implementing the dependency inversion principle in particular, and the other solid principles as well, actually, although I haven't talked so much about that. But the thing about TDD is it won't suddenly turn you into an expert designer. It won't tell you when it's a bad idea to have that abstractions, and when you should actually just stick with a simpler design and test it in a in a more coupled way, or not test it with a unit test, use an integration test or something. Kent Beck says in the, uh, in the, the Hangouts that if you end up with a bad design, it's like blaming the car when you end up in a bad place. 
you're actually, um, it's not the TDD, the tool, that's m making your design bad. It's you as a designer that have made poor decisions. But I think he needn't go far enough. Kent needs to ad admit that actually TDD gives you a bias, uh, a bias towards indirection and interfaces and all that, and that you should be aware of that as a designer, that you can go too far. So I found that very interesting. Um, I thought David's uh, second point, although I don't agree with his um, conclusions that it does cause design damage, but I agree that it, um, it's something to think about. Layers of indirection can get out of control. So let's uh, look at his third point, which is that there he thinks there is too much focus on unit tests, <coughs> that there are other kinds of tests that are more useful. So at a first reading of this, you think, he's telling us not to write unit tests. He must be telling us to do cardboard coding and not write tests at all. You know, is that the alternative? Is it, is it as simple as that? You either write unit tests or you're a cowboy? Well, clearly, no, that's not what he's saying. So when I titled this talk, what, what are the alternatives to TDD? Well, let's, let's talk about that. And I don't think cowboy coding is one of the best alternatives. So uh, let's look at something a bit more, more useful. Now, I showed you this slide before about the, what happens when you do TDD. One of the things you get from TDD is this ability to pinpoint defects. You have a one failing unit test and you can see, oh, that bit of code has gone wrong. So what you end up with is something that Martin Fowler calls self-testing code. And he's written a very good description of this that I like, that you have self-testing code when you can run a series of automated tests against the code base and be confident that if the tests pass, your code is free of any substantial defects. And if you've done TDD on a code base, you have a lot of tests. And you can probably run them really quickly. And to some extent, you have self-testing code. But that's not the full story. Because if all your unit tests pass, you can't be completely sure that your code is free of any substantial defects. Because there are classes of defects that unit tests do not find, kind of by definition. They do not find integration errors, for example. And depending on what you're working on, that can be a significant source of errors. So it's never enough to only have unit tests for your system. So you're going to be writing other kinds of automated tests too. And often people explain this with uh, the Agile testing pyramid. Have you, I guess you've seen this before? <coughs> no, no, a few people. Well, this uh, is an idea that a guy called Mike Cohn came up with um, when he was trying to explain to teams what kinds of tests they should be writing. And the base of the pyramid is the unit test, these totally isolated, super fast tests. But then the layer above is a bit more integration test kind of things. He called it service tests because they're accessing um, through an API the service layer of your application, the part that has the business logic, the part that uh, implements the functionality, and you're accessing it via an API, whereas the actual users would probably use some kind of um, graphical user interface. Because for a test, it's much more convenient to use a, a programmatic interface um, for many reasons much more maintainable. But uh, you still need a few tests there at the top of the pyramid that access your application the same way as your users do through the graphical user interface. And they will test the whole, the whole full stack. So this uh, has been around for a while, and, and Mike Cohn has been using it to explain to teams, well, you need to really have a lot of unit tests. That's your primary focus, and a few of the other kinds. And then I met a guy from uh, ThoughtWorks he went around putting numbers on this and said, oh, 70% of your tests should be unit tests, 25% uh, using some kind of API, and only 5% going through the full stack through the user interface. So the guy from ThoughtWorks says it, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> I totally disagree. I think basically this advice from both Mike Cohn and the guy from ThoughtWorks is totally aimed at beginners, people who've, who don't have any tests. Um, because a typical beginner's mistake is to invest far too much in these uh, full stack tests through the user interface that are very expensive to maintain, difficult to create, and uh, 
you would be better off finding the same errors with unit tests. So again, this is advice that's aimed at beginners, and David is not a beginner. So I think we need to take a second look at the Agile testing pyramid from the point of view of what if you're actually an expert and you really know your stuff about unit testing. Well, the unit tests have lots of advantages. They run really quickly, they can pinpoint your defects, and they are very cheap to maintain relatively. Whereas these other tests, um, higher up the pyramid, they will test a whole feature. So they have this ability to find whole broken features, stuff your user actually really cares about if it doesn't work. They will find integration errors, which actually can be a quite a significant source of errors in some situations. But they have this much higher cost. They take longer to run, usually, and they are much more expensive to maintain, particularly the ones going through the user interface, because the user interface is designed for people to use, not machines, and it's actually very difficult to get the threading and the timing right for a machine to use the user interface. So this is uh, why people recommend that you concentrate on learning the unit tests, at least when you're beginning. So I wanted to tell you about something I did recently. I developed a Git hook. What's a Git hook, you're thinking? Well, you as a developer, you push some changes up to your Git server. You've been working on some code. You've committed it and pushed it. The Git server has a little place where you can put a piece of a script that will be called every time someone pushes a change to that repository. So this was a hook script that I was developing so that any time anyone would push to the repository, it would call a little tool called Jenkins Job Builder to create a Jenkins job and then use like curl to trigger a build of that job. So I wanted to develop and test this hook script. If you notice, this hook script is integrating a Git server and Jenkins. It's all about integration. There is actually very little functionality in the script by itself. And so I didn't want, to, I, I thought, well, what, how can I test this? So I started by saying, well, I need a Git server that's actually going to trigger the hook. So I wrote a little test fixture that would take a tiny repo with like no files in it and just uh, have a, create a, a, a push to that that would trigger my hook script. And then, of course, I wanted to check that I was correctly creating a Jenkins job, but I didn't want to run Jenkins job builder all the time or have a real Jenkins server, because they're quite heavyweight, actually, to set up on your development machine. Git servers are very lightweight. They're, I No problem creating one of those. But I wanted to mock all this other stuff. So I used a little tool called Capture Mock, um, which is very useful for man in the middle mocking, as I've been calling it. So in record mode, it sits like a man in the middle attack and records the traffic and, and analyzes the traffic. And then when you want to replay, it will, um, it will just replay the same interactions back to you. And you can remove the actual Jenkins server entirely and your test will be none the wiser because it gets exactly the same traffic from the capture mock. So this um, is how I developed this tool. I had an actual Git server and I mocked the Jenkins part. So if you looked at one of my test cases, I had a, a little Git repository that contained some, some files because the Jenkins job that you create should depend slightly on what kind of repository it is. If it's a Java repository or a Scala repository, it needs to build quite differently in Jenkins. Um, so that was one part of the test. The next part was the test fixture that was going to push the code. Um, then I had uh, the capture mock recorded interactions with Jenkins Job Builder. And then I was actually te using an approval testing technique. So instead of having assertions in my test, I just have my hook script write a log that I save in a file and uh, record that as my golden master. And the next time I run the test, I just diff, did the log change. Um, and of course, I filter out the timestamps so it, it only actually diffs if there's an actual difference. Um, and the tool I've been using is, is Text Test, which is a tool I'm helping to develop. So this is what a test case for this hook script looks like. This is not a unit test. I do not have any unit tests for this hook script because it's entirely about integrating Git and Jenkins, and I wanted to actually have a test that would test the integration. And I found 
that I've been doing this more and more lately, that I've been writing less unit tests and more integration tests. And that's, I think, mostly because of the kind of code I've been writing. It's not your classic business logic. It's been lots of integrating um, stuff. And I think what David is saying is, is very important, that this thing with having the numbers on the pyramid, no, forget that. That's advice for complete beginners who don't have a clue. When you know what you're doing, you need to tailor your approach. As David says, if you have a very simple model layer, that's the, I like the service layer, but your UI is complex, then you probably need more system tests. You system test heavy, model test light. The pyramid might not look like a pyramid. It might, it might actually look like you flipped it, but that might be the right decision for that system. And that depends on what you're building. Those, those higher level tests are harder to write, but if you do them well, they actually, I think, pay back very well in finding bugs, often compared with unit tests. So this is uh, my final slide, just to summarize what I've said about test-driven development and the alternatives. Well, I've talked about David Heinemar Hansen and his objections to test-driven development, and that it is dead, <laughs> which I don't think it is. But anyway, he, he wrote this very um, argumentative piece with these arguments. And Kent Beck and Martin Fowler discussed this with him, and now I've presented my opinions. But I think basically a lot of what he's arguing against is the kind of TDD advice that you give to beginners. And historically, there have been a lot of beginners. But as we, we saw just with a show of hands, most people today have done TDD or at least are, are writing a lot of unit tests. And maybe it's time to move beyond all that advice that we got to beginners. We, we need to learn TDD. We need to get better at TDD. And that needs to be based on, on um, finding out where it works well and experiencing when it works well, I think. When you're doing TDD, you need to be aware of the effect it's probably going to have on your design, pushing you towards um, dependency inversion and pushing you to add layers of abstraction. And that's often a good thing, but not always. Then I think you need to not forget the other parts of the testing pyramid. You do not have self-testing code if you only have unit tests. You cannot be certain that it's free of substantial defects, I think, until you have at least a couple of tests that exercise the whole, the whole system and not just each unit. I wanted to mention text tests because I'm working on it and I think it's a really cool thing. And there's another session later on today about approval testing, which is the principle behind text test. So I do encourage you to find out more about that because it's, um, it's not all about unit testing. There's, there's other kinds of tests which can be very useful. So that's my uh, summary of what I had to say. And um, please give me some feedback on your way out. <laughs>